me right now at Heels or at the Heels, and the other group meets here. So the group will meet here at 6:30, and uh, you get to have anything infinite menu, anything you want for supper. You just pick it up and bring it, and uh, and it'll be at 6:30, and we will be continuing. This week's study questions are on the table in the back. Um, two weeks from today. We're going to have a picnic in the park at Triple Creek Park, right after church. What we are going to do, the church is going to furnish hot dogs and buns and paper products. And uh, what we'd like you to do is sign up for sides. Please put the side and your name uh, that you plan to bring. And um, let's have a great time together. Two weeks from today, the weather should be a little cooler. And uh, last time we were there, it was just enough breeze, it was perfect. We got the pavilion reserved, and looking forward to that. Two weeks from today. Our missions this month are uh, the American Center for Law and Justice, and also the Cumberland Crisis Pregnancy Center. They're receiving 25% of our offerings this month, will be divided between those two groups. And uh, I do have a point of personal privilege you know, I know the stock market crashed this week, you know. The elections are in turmoil. Big stinking deal. We got a new granddaughter. <laughs> That's the big news. And Adelbel is here, five pounds, seven ounces, and she's healthy and doing great. And uh, Lindsay's doing fine. Lindsay does have some health things that she's struggling with, and that's, uh, you know, keep praying for her. But uh, Ayla's the uh, most beautiful little girl ever been born. And when I made that comment, Allie said, Daddy, what about me? I said, you've held the title for 33 years. So, but uh, no, she is a precious, precious little girl. And uh, she really loves her grandma. Uh, when I can get her away from grandma, I'll get a minute to hold her. So, but thank you all for your prayers over these last few months. And, uh, and all is well. We're very thankful. The title of the message this morning is To Gain God's Wisdom. It's something we all need. Something I think we all wish we had more of. Amen? Amen. But before I begin this morning about gaining God's wisdom, I think this plays into it. It's certainly part of the thing. But I want to say a word about prophecy. We're going to get into Daniel, which gets into... Uh, prophetic things to come. Daniel parallels a lot with Revelation and uh, a lot of deals with latter days. Folks, we are clearly called in the scripture to study prophecy. And our church spent its first six months in existence studying Revelation, by the way. Those of you who were here remember that. Um, but one thing I've learned in 28 years of ministry Take it for what it says. I grew up under the ministry of Dr. Fred Wood, Fred, Fred M. Wood, who was a tremendous scholar. He wrote commentaries on, and had published commentaries on Jeremiah, Hosea, Galatians, and several other books he had published. Brilliant theologian. Uh, he's with the Lord now. But uh, during my youth and young adult years, I became a deacon under him. He did our wedding. And he was an older man by this time. And he had a way of, uh, when he was thinking, he, his, he would wrinkle his face when he was thinking and saying something. And along about the 1970s, a lot of prophecy stuff was in a firestorm. Everybody was talking about it. Late great planet Earth. Uh, a lot of prophecy was going on in the late 70s. And I was getting kind of hepped up over it. And we were at church, and, and we were really growing in the Lord, and I was excited. And he told me one night, he goes, Steve, be careful. He said, when I was a young preacher boy, I opened the Bible one Sunday night in my little country church, and I stood in the pulpit. And with great research and great authority, I proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist. Steve, be careful. 
<laughs> that is godly wisdom. Amen. In 1970, The Late Great Planet Earth was published, best-selling book by Hal Lindsey, Carol Colson, first published by Zondervan. Adapted, later made into a movie, narrated by Orson Welles. And Lindsay and Carlson went on to write several sequels, including Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth, and the 1980s Countdown to Armageddon. Well, I know that Satan's alive. I don't think he's all that well. I think he's like a wounded lion, and he's desperate because he knows he loses in the end. In the 1980s, I got news, folks. I can tell you this is authoritatively prophetic fact. The countdown to Armageddon did not begin in the 1980s. It began when our Lord Jesus cried, It is finished. Amen. In the late 70s, I started hearing all these prophecy guys all over the radio talking about the European common market. European common markets, the ten horned beast. There were nine members at the time. They said, oh, get ready. They're talking about a tenth member, and boy, get ready. It's going to all break loose then. In 1981, Greece became the tenth member. And the beast is going to come rising out of the ocean. Well, guess what? That was 34 years have passed. There's now 28 members, and these guys were wrong. Be careful about trying to take the evening news and plug it into prophecy. We can look at prophecy, and we can look back at things that have been fulfilled and say, okay, there it is. Yes, the Word of God is true. There it is. We can look at the prophecy that of the dr uh, dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had and see that Yes, the uh, empires that followed him came in succession, and they weren't as great as his, and they, they fell. And then there's some latter days things of the ten toes that were crushed by the rock not made with hands, which is uh, clearly a reference to Christ. And I think those ten toes are clearly some reference to an earthly government. But you know what? We don't know what that government is. We don't know when it's going to happen. And why would we keep trying to pretend we know more than Daniel or John, be careful. This church is not going to go to seed, chasing its tail, trying to analyze this stuff. We're going to study it, and we're going to take it as it says. Daniel, along with the children of Israel, were conquered, and they led, a, led away captive into Babylon. Daniel had shown himself to be of great faith considered one of the wise men. But the king reached a point in his life that a lot of people have reached where they become a disdain for all things spiritual. He had a dream that plagued him, and he wanted to know what the dream was and the analysis of it. And nobody could tell him. He called the astrologers and the soothsayers and the sorcerers and all. Nobody could tell him. And so, in frustration, he ordered them all killed. This morning we'll read Daniel chapter 20, uh, verse, excuse me, chapter 2, verses 20 through 30. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel prayed and received a revelation from God of what the dream was and the interpretation of it. And Daniel prayed and gave praise to God. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells in him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You've given me wisdom and might. And have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. 
And Ariok quickly brought Daniel before the king and thus said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known the king's the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your, uh, of, excuse me, your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. <coughs> Daniel was clearly given the wisdom from God. Is that same wisdom available to us? Yes. How can we have godly wisdom? How can we get the wisdom of God in our current life? How can you get the wisdom of God in your current circumstance, the current struggle that you're facing? How can you get the wisdom of God in that current struggle of your own heart that you're dealing with? There are, there are three things I think have to happen for the person. And this is specifically speaking to the Christian, to the person who is a Christ follower, who has given your heart to Christ. First of all, there's got to be gratefulness of heart. Daniel said, I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You've given me wisdom and might and have made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. A grateful heart. Part of our problem, I think, in in Pretty much everyone who travels overseas to the third world comes back and says, wow, we're spoiled. We've come to expect things. We've come to have a sense of entitlement, that we're entitled to a certain standard of living. Rather than being grateful. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything give thanks. Folks, that's even in the bad times. Stop and think what you can you give thanks for. There's always something. Doctor says you've got cancer. Lord, thank you for the medical care you've made available to me. Thank you for the sustaining grace you've given me. Thank you for the supportive family you've given me. Thank you that I live where I can get good care. Thank you, Lord, for insurance. Even bad insurance better than other <coughs> I love that old hymn, count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. That's where that journal comes in handy. Folks, we've become complacent, resting in the blessings that we've already been given, and actually coming to just expect that they continue. And I'm more and more concerned for our nation for that reason. It's getting harder and harder to sing God bless America with any sense of expectancy when we are turning so hard against him. Even codifying things that are against him in the law of the land. But it takes a grateful heart to get the wisdom of God. So start by giving thanks because we are greatly blessed, every last one of us. You know, when I went through some struggles in ministry years ago, man, a lot of just things couldn't, couldn't get bad and couldn't get worse. I've been spending 
you know, I don't have anywhere to turn. You know what? God opened a door for me. And there's greater freedom and peace and joy in that new area of ministry than it had ever been before. Thank you, Jesus, for the struggles of the past. For they led to greater days ahead. Secondly, grateful heart and faith to move forward. When Daniel was given the revelation, he didn't hunker down and say, boy, we better wait till the king calms down a little bit. No, it said in verse 24, Daniel went to Arioch, the king, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. The main hitman, he went to him. And said to him, do not destroy the wise men, take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Folks, oftentimes God opens a door for us, and we just won't walk through it. We'll come up with an excuse, or we'll figure out a reason why we can't. Hebrews 11, 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Folks, we've got to have the faith to move forward in the door that he opens. Now, there have been things that might have been open doors for us in the past, and we'd sit down with the elders and we would pray about them, and God would either give us the reality that this is something you need to move on or this is not. And that's not what we're, no, we're not, we're talking about wisdom here. But when he clearly gives the signal, he doesn't always tell you every detail, how it's going to work out or how you can do it. He just tells you to do it. Have the faith to move forward. When Charles Kettering was the head of research for General Motors, he said when sometimes he'd have a problem that he needed a solution to, and he would put a table outside the conference room, we would call all his scientists in together, and he would put a sign on that table, leave your slide rules here. And he wouldn't let them bring them in for the discussion of the problem. He said, because if I didn't do that, somebody would start reaching for his slide rule and get on his feet and say, boss, you can't do it. We depend too much on human logic. We won't ever move forward. Moving forward requires faith. A grateful heart and the faith to move forward, a desire to follow God's will. <coughs> and a third attribute that Daniel distributed, exhibited, and that we must demonstrate if we hope to move forward is humility to give God all the glory. Amen. We didn't do it. He did. Verses 27 28 said, Daniel answered in the presence of the king. He said, the, king, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the musicians, the soothsayers, cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to the king what will be in the latter days. Do you realize? He, he became a non-issue. He was just a conduit. He took no credit in and of himself. He didn't say, God showed it to me, to me, so I can show it to you. No, he didn't do that, did he? He didn't even exist. There's a God in heaven who reveals it, and he's done it for the king. I've often called myself living proof that God can use absolutely anybody. He can take an old broken down home builder from Cairo, Tennessee and turn him into a preacher. He can take a donkey and speak through him to his prophet. He can do anything through anyone Amen. who will allow mm -hmm. and give him the glory. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. <clears throat> One of the great enigmas of our day when the church is by and large declining and by and large failing to attract young people, one of the great enigmas has been the phenomena of Long Hollow Baptist Church. They have grown enormously. And I can tell you that it's not 
an entertainment venue. Uh, Pastor David Lambert preached a solid word of God. I was in school with David, and he preached this word solidly then until the time of his home going. David, I think his greatest attribute was his humility. That church grew so enormously, they got national attention, and over and over and over again, publications were calling, wanting to interview the pastor. You know what? He declined every interview. He did not want to touch the glory of God. David, Daniel, went on to refer to himself in verse 30. He said, but as for me, this secret's not been revealed to me because I'm wiser than anyone living. But for our sakes, to make known the interpretation of the king, in other words, to save our lives, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. <coughs> He's making it very clear. He's just the instrument. That's all. You know, if, if uh, <coughs> this prayer rail, a lot of labor went into it. Very well done, well built. The one who built it didn't take any bows. But to give all the praise to a person would be like giving all the praise to a hammer. If God's doing it, it's not the hammer, it's not the person, it's God. So you give him the glory. And you become the non-issue. 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. <clears throat> Beloved, if you decide you've got some spiritual edge on everybody else, you've got a spiritual problem. <clears throat> Samuel Morris invented the Telegraph, and he got a lot of uh, accolades and awards for that great invention that really opened up communications across the country. Invented in Morse code, of course. More than once, and he was asked, and he 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 said more than once, whenever I could not see my way clearly, I knelt down and prayed to God for light. He got all these awards, but he never felt he deserved any of them. He said, I have made a valuable application of electricity, not because I was superior to other men, but solely because God, who meant it for mankind, must reveal it to someone, and he was pleased to reveal it to me. Mm -hmm. To God be all the glory. Folks, you meet someone who wants to grab their own glory, you're meeting someone who's got a problem. And someone who will run out of the will of God at some point. Because at some point they start feeding their own ego rather than seeking the glory of God. Romans 12, 3 says, I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. I met one of these prophecy preachers a few years ago at a booksellers conference, and, and it was back when I had a, a business and we had a booth there, and this author, and if I named him, you'd, you'd know him, uh, he's one of the big names out of Texas, no, it's not Joel, but uh, this guy was a big prophecy writer, and he had a book that's out, and when you go to these, these writers' conferences, you pay money to get there, and you get a lot of free book, free books, free stuff. And he was giving away autographed copies of his book. So I thought, well, that's cool. I'll meet him. Pastor, good to meet you. I'm a pastor of Tennessee. And he got he did his preacher voice. He goes, Brother, every member of your congregation needs to read this book. I said, Well, thank you. I'll, I'll make sure and loan it to him. Boy, I got the most disgusted look you ever saw. <laughs> the folks that get all hung up trying to analyze and trying to know more than what God reveals. 
And there's nothing wrong with surmising this could work out this way or this looks like this might be how it's going to play out. But I'm going to tell you, anything forward looking is conjecture. <coughs> and anyone that claims to have more than that, they're either selling books or they're very naive or they're in bondage of intellectual arrogance. Oh. Pretty good indicator. If you got a pride problem, is if you think of yourself more highly than someone else. Because that handicapped, mentally challenged, poor child, half starved, in the most backward village, of the most remote third world country, means just as much to God as you. Galatians 6, 2-4, in closing. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. We are privileged because of who Jesus is. We are blessed because of who he is. And all that we do needs to be to his glory and to point others to him. That's our purpose. It's all about Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we praise your name today and we thank you for your revealing us a glimpse of things to come. For in so doing, we see how some of those things have already come about, and that validates for us that the things that are forward coming will, in fact, happen. You will come again. You will rule. Oh, Lord, we rest and rejoice in that truth. Father, today we want to lay pride aside. And in all things, give us grateful hearts, faith to move forward, and a passion to give you glory. Father, just glorify yourself. As we open the altar today for a time to just lay self on the altar and give you our burdens, our gifts, our passions, our desire is to glorify you. Father, reveal yourself to someone today if they know you not as Savior and Lord and let this be the day when they open their heart and receive the gift of eternal life and the indwelling of your Spirit that they might become a new creature in you. Jesus, you're still in the life-transforming business and our desire is to grow your kingdom or to see it grow. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said.